Good afternoon and welcome to Seniors Count. I'm your host, Tula Mall. On our show, we believe that you are the foundation on which Boston was built. So our goal is to connect you to resources, benefits, and information to enhance your life. Thank you for joining us. Today we welcome Dr. Alice Lichtenstein from the Jean Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad to be here. So uh, I wanted to start, could you just tell us a little bit about the Tufts Human Nutrition Center on Aging and the research being done there? Well, we are a um, research center within Tufts University that is focused specifically on nutrition, aging-related nutrition research. And we are, the reason that we have such a long name is because there are a number of research centers that are actually part of the USDA system. However, we're the only one that focuses specifically on aging. Um, in terms of the range of research we focus on, it almost any part of the human body. We have a number of different um, research groups, and I, the um, director of the Cardiovascular Nutrition Research Laboratory, but there are a wide range of other laboratories that focus on bone, eyes, immunology, almost anything. Wow. Um, can you discuss with us why there may be differences in nutrition specifically for older adults versus middle-aged or... Well, as we age, we do change a little bit. Um, our energy needs, the amount of calories that we need to maintain our body weight goes down. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for that, so I know it's unfortunate, <laughs> but it happens and we might as well get used to it. Um, the reason for that is that even if we don't change our body weight, um, the, our body composition changes so that we have a little more fat, we have a little less lean muscle mass, and that means we need fewer calories. Um, sometimes we slow down a little bit, which means we mm. need um, a few fewer calories, so that's one factor. However, our nutrient needs don't really go down in the same way. In fact, sometimes our nutrient needs go up. So what that means is that we need to be more concerned about the foods that we choose to consume. So they're more what we call nutrient dense, which mm -hmm. means that there's just a higher concentration of nutrients per calorie. So can you explain that a little bit more? So we're talking mm -hmm. about nutrients versus calories, and for people out there, they may not know what those, I mean, those are kind of technical things. Sure. So calories are the, um, it's, it's the amount of energy that's in a food. Mm -hmm. So the easiest way to think about it is most people need between 2,000 and 1,800 calories to maintain their body weight. If they consume more calories than they need, mm -hmm. then they're going to gain weight. Mm -hmm. If they consume fewer calories than they need, they're going to lose weight. Yeah. And um, part of the determination of how many calories you actually need to maintain your body weight has to do with how physically active you are. The more physically active you are, the more calories you burn. On the other hand, nutrients are things that are in food that our bodies can't make. So they're called essential. And that means that we have to consume them. If we don't consume enough of them, then we will become deficient eventually and our body functions may change. So it's important to consume adequate amount of nutrients. Um, consuming over and above what we need doesn't really help us. So things, oh. so things like vitamins and minerals mm -hmm. are considered to be essential we need to consume them. So when I say that we um, need fewer calories as we get older to maintain the same amount of weight, if we need the same amount of nutrients, that means we need to be a little more careful about picking foods that have those nutrients that our body does need. So could I say that like uh, a piece of candy has mm -hmm. a lot of calories but few nutrients, right? Because it probably has Correct. sugar. Correct, yep. Probably just That's sugar. That's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, like, I don't know, I'm thinking kale or collard greens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have maybe less calories but are full of nutrients. So that's... Exactly. However, it's also important to keep in mind that different foods have different types of nutrients. Mm -hmm. So although kale and carrots may be very high in certain nutrients, they're not going to contain other ones that, for example, low-fat dairy products have mm -hmm. or that um, whole grains have. So we really need to have a balance of different types of nutrient-dense foods. Okay. And what do you think, because you kind of touched upon it there about taking supplements or vitamins, does that help? Yeah, when you're aging and consuming all those nutrients that you need? Well, for the most part, actually, no. And that okay. is a bit surprising. Yeah. And the reason for that is we need a minimum amount. We need a certain amount for our bodies to function, op function optimally. Mm -hmm. 
extra doesn't really help us. And in some cases, it can actually get us in trouble, particularly for the fat-soluble vitamins where we don't have a mechanism for actually excreting them, getting the extra out of our body. For mm -hmm. water-soluble vitamins, they do come out in the urine. So there's been a lot of um, work done on whether, let's for example, a multivitamin um, will help people as they get older. And the general conclusion is, Probably not. For the majority of people, wow. no. Mm -hmm. But what is important is they eat a good, well-balanced diet. So what would be a fat-soluble? Fat-soluble vitamin? Yeah, right. A fat-soluble vitamin would be something like vitamin A or vitamin D. A water-soluble vitamin would be something like vitamin C or thiamine. Okay, wow. So the fat-soluble ones you're saying basically get stuck in our body, mm -hmm. whereas the water-solubles get flushed out. Right, and some of the ones that get stuck in our bodies, if we have really high can levels, build it up, yeah. then they can do bad things in our bodies. Wow, so interesting. Um, can you share with us some research about how nutrition intake is different, uh, and like maybe break it down by decades, or, or, or maybe it might be easier for you to talk about like, a plate of food mm -hmm. for someone 60, 70, 80, mm -hmm. and so on. Well, that's actually a common question. How do things change mm -hmm. by the decade? Yeah. And it turns out there's no simple answer for that because okay. we all age very differently and we all handle aging very differently. Mm. So in some cases, people actually increase their level of physical activity because they um, have more time to True. go walking yep. or to engage in, a, in a, some kind of exercise program. Whereas other people who may have some debilitating disorder may actually dramatically decrease mm -hmm. their level of physical activity. And for some individuals, they, they remain very healthy and need an sort of the similar amount of nutrients that they um, consume when they were younger. And for other individuals that may have had surgery or something else, they may need slightly more. So we really can't talk about, well, mm. at this point. Yeah, 61, this right. is what you need to you know, suddenly, start doing. Right, suddenly your birthday cake <laughs> yeah. changes and your next breakfast should change. But we can give general advice, and I think that's what's really important. And that is to, well, first develop healthy eating patterns early in life. Absolutely. And if you have a lot of um, contact with grandchildren, it's not what I say, it's what I do, so be a very good role model. Yeah. But that is consuming a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low in non-fat dairy products, mm -hmm. fish, and lean meat. And by having that range of foods, first of all, they're moderate in calories, but second, they do have a lot of, or essentially all the essential nutrients that we need. Mm -hmm. um, then it comes to the quantity, and it comes to personal preference, and I think that's one other thing that's very important to remember. In some cases, we, um, our tastes don't change, mm. and our preferences don't change. In other cases, mm. they might. Mm. And what's really important is that the general guidance about the fruits and vegetables and whole grains and low and non-fat dairy and the fish and lean meat, and, and I should also throw in legumes and nuts, mm -hmm. um, that can be customized so that um, for different people due to personal preferences, cultural and ethnic backgrounds. So it's not something that one size fits all. And if you don't do this, okay. you're not eating a healthy diet. You should be able to somehow modify things in order to really make it what you enjoy most. And do you feel that it's um, kind of intuitive? Like how does someone know, okay, you know, that I need to start changing the way I eat? Or, or do you feel that maybe people start realizing like, oh, I'm full a lot more? Or just, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, again, um, I think that's a good question. It really varies tremendously. For some individuals, they just automatically adjust, and we don't have, you know, they don't have to worry about it at all. Others, their clothes start feeling a little tighter, mm. or their physician will say something to them about perhaps they were gaining too much weight, or in some cases, losing weight. Mm. And that's when they really have to start thinking about it a little more and whether it's just re sort of becoming more aware of what their food choices are, what happens to be in the house. Um, it may be that they shifted more to um, preparing food at home or they shifted more to eating out. And when you eat out, you don't have as many choices. Mm. So 
what should be possible is that people make small changes to increase the um, quality of their diet and shouldn't have to have a radical makeover because I think that's really hard to sustain in the long run. Mm -hmm. And so that's another point is going to your doctors, you know, and getting your annual checkup because they may be able to point something out, whether it's in your blood sugar or something like, okay, maybe you need to start thinking about eating in a certain way. It's mm -hmm. very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what are some common misconceptions about foods that older adults eat? Well, I think common misconceptions. Um, one is that you have to make a radical change in your diet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, as we just discussed, really not the case. Um, another is that, well, if I find one food that somebody tells me is really healthy for me, mm -hmm. let's say kale is the latest, yeah. um, then the more kale I eat, the better the quality of my diet. Mm -hmm. Um, in some cases, there are food fads out there. So now there's this whole low gluten, you know, gluten mm -hmm. sensitivity, that yeah. that's the fad, that all food should be low in gluten. And um, in reality, th there's no evidence for that. There are some individuals that really are very sensitive to gluten, but I think um, one needs to be um, aware that in some cases things are just fads and it probably doesn't necessarily affect um, them. And then there, uh, I think another is that, oh, you see a bar, and this bar has 100% of everything, uh -huh. plus it's oh, organic yes. and it's natural. The bars with everything. With everything. <laughs> and first of all, most of the time they don't taste that yeah. good. But um, second of all, you don't need 100% of everything in a, every single food you consume. Mm. So we're gonna take a break real quick, but we'll be back and continue this conversation. Great. Don't let E. coli mosh with your food. An estimated 3,000 Americans die from a foodborne illness each year. You can't see these microbes, but they might be there. So always separate raw meat from vegetables. Keep your family safe at foodsafety.gov. Hart, what's going on? I'm leaving. Why? What did I do? Not enough. You constantly ignore me. You barely eat anything healthy. You're half as active as you used to be. The pressure is just too much. I quit. Okay, I get it. I'll do better. Just please, don't leave. Okay, but remember, if I go, you go. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Alice Lichtenstein. She's from the uh, Human Re Nutrition Center on Aging at Tufts and talking about... Um, how food and nutrition is different for older adults. So I want to go back uh, to what we're talking about, the plate. And uh, you talk about you know, a healthy plate. Can you, can you describe it a little bit more for us? Sure. I think a quick way of um, formatting a healthy plate is to that about half of it should be the fruits and vegetables. And you know, it's not worth arguing about whether broccoli is a fruit or a vegetable, yeah. a flower or a tomato, anything like that. But just about half of it should be fruits and vegetables. And, the, and it would be nice if there were different colors, so something like spinach and carrots. Mm -hmm. um, about a quarter of it can be the protein food, if that's what you prefer. Mm -hmm. And then a quarter of it should be the grains and preferably whole grains. It doesn't have to be 100% of the time, but we're really fortunate that now for whole grains, for a lot of our um, common foods, we have a whole grain option. Great. And uh, has, is there any research being done around how you can reinvent, reinvent some 
um, you know, dishes that people grow up with that may be higher in fat, like macaroni and cheese or, I don't know, a fried pork chop, uh, that so people can still have what um, they've grown up eating or what they love, but they can make it in a much, I guess, healthier way. Sure. Well, actually, that's more in the lay press than research. Okay. And it's a matter of um, dietitians, people that have a background in nutrition and food, looking at the individual ingredients and making some um, substitutions. So in a lot of the current magazines that are out there, um, you see some examples, but to, um, let's say for macaroni and cheese. Mm -hmm. It could be a matter of using the reduced fat cheese that's now on the market, mm -hmm. and um, whole wheat pasta, which actually can make it more interesting as yeah. far as flavors go. Absolutely. In um, some cases, um, it's choosing a leaner cut of meat. It can be the same type of meat that you're used to consuming, but a leaner cut, and then we always have to think about portion size. Oh, oh yes. Um, that you know, it, that it's okay um, on certain occasions to eat things that you may consider not as healthy, but um, if the portion size isn't huge, then there's no reason to enjoy it, not to enjoy it. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I think we should talk a little bit about fat, because um, certainly in the 90s, fat was definitely the villain. <laughs> and I just talked about leaner cuts of meat, and I talked about reduced fat dairy products. But the reason I did that is because they're the ones that are highest in saturated fat. And saturated fat is associated with increased risk of heart disease. But we don't want people actually to cut most of the fat out of their diet, because they're healthy fats, which are actually good for us and better than refined carbohydrate, which is frequently what people substitute. So those would be things like vegetable oil, soybean mm. oil, canola oil, olive oil, whatever your preference is there. But to include those into the diet is actually quite important. All right. So that's actually a perfect segue because when we talked about like the, the change that has come into the nutritional plate from fat to sugar, uh, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about sugar. So like you said, recently there have been some changes in the guidelines around how much sugar to consume. Back in the 90s when it was cut the fat, cut the fat, cut the fat, basically what they were doing was adding sugar. Mm -hmm. um, so what were the previous guidelines? How have they changed? And uh, what prompted this change? Well, there actually, we never had specific guidelines on sugar, okay. but we never really thought about it all that much. Now there are proposed guidelines, and they would be lower than what we're currently consuming. And the reason that this has come up is because we found that as the fat content of the diet went down, mm -hmm. when we thought we demonized fat, it was replaced with things like fat-free brownies and ice cream <laughs> and cookies yeah. and all these things that are really high in sugar. And Sometimes people didn't even realize they were high in sugar because there are a lot of different names for sugar. Yes. Things there like are. sure. So there's sucrose, there's fructose, there's glucose, there's concentrated uh, fruit juice, oh. there's honey, there's molasses, there's dextrose, there's maple syrup, there's corn syrup. So there are a, a lot of synonyms for sugar. And what the FDA has proposed, and we don't know if this is going to happen, okay. is that they all be considered added sugar and actually labeled on the list. But you don't really need that. I think if we were to query people, they would know what foods they're consuming that are really high in sugar. And the thing is, they don't have to cut them all out. Yeah. It's just a matter of choose a couple of them, and again, watch portion size. So that's so funny you said that, because my next question is, what is meant by sugar? And exactly what you said, there's honey, agave syrup, and maple syrup, there's artificial sweeteners. Well, and that's then, different. That okay. comes into different categories. All right, well, then let's, and then, fruit, mm -hmm. and then fructose corn syrup. So fructose corn syrup technically is considered part of the whole, like you said, mm -hmm. honey, agave mm -hmm. syrup. Mm -hmm. But can you talk to us about artificial uh, sweeteners, and, and how is that different? Sure, okay, well, artificial sweeteners doesn't come with calories, okay. but it just, it does sweeten a product. So that would be the difference between regular soda and um, diet soda. Okay. Um, now, we've been looking for a long time for something we're wrong with artificial sweeteners. Mm -hmm. And within the context of what we're currently consuming, there doesn't seem to be that much of a problem. So if someone were to substitute, let's say, a diet soda for a regular soda, they could cut a lot of calories out of their diet. And it would be calories that don't come with other nutrients. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that as our caloric requirements go down but our nutrient requirements don't, we have to figure out how to 
choose more nutrient dense foods. Well, one way to do that and to balance the diet is to take out those foods that don't come with a lot of nutrients, and that would be things like uh, foods that are high in sugar. Okay, well, so that, that's really interesting that, that we haven't found. And so are all artificial sweeteners on the same level? I mean, there's, you go to the store and there's the white, the yellow, the, 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 the blue, pink, the blue. blue. Yeah, now there's all yeah. these names of all these other ones. I, I'd say the jury's out okay. on that. So but it seems that within a reasonable um, consumption level, yeah. there doesn't seem to be a major problem. Okay, what about sugars found uh, naturally, like in sweet potato or in, I'm um, trying to think, dates. Dates sure. are so sweet. Yeah, okay, well that's an interesting, because there, most of the time, if it's in fruits mm -hmm. or something like sweet potatoes, then the food has other nutrients in it. Mm. And just because something's sweet doesn't mean it's bad okay. for you. <laughs> it's just that, um, well, with sweet potatoes, that's a great choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it actually counts as a vegetable. It and does. it's colored so that it's great to pair with a green vegetable. Mm -hmm. um, with dried fruit, those are fine, and they have the, most of the nutrients that are in the regular fruit. But we do have to be careful because their uh, volume is smaller, so mm -hmm. it's easier to overconsume and think about it if you're eating, um, let's say, apricots, dried apricots. Oh, yeah. You can eat quite a few <laughs> halves of those dried apricots without yeah. mu thinking much, whereas with a fresh apricot, you wouldn't do that. So that's the only caveat there. And something I've found interesting about dried fruit is that sometimes it has added sugar. It does, and that's a matter of um, picking and choosing carefully. And yeah. It's, you just have to read the label once yeah. and choose the best one for you. It it's shouldn't be an arduous task. You just have to do it once or twice. Yeah, I, it's, it's, I'm always so interested in looking at the labels and mm -hmm. you know, finding those like hidden sugars yeah. in there. Except for um, cranberries. Cranberries you cannot really consume. They're dry. tough. Yeah. They are tough. Yeah. But like tart cherries, so mm -hmm. I found tart cherries without sugar and then those with, with yeah. sugar. And I actually don't mind the ones without sugar. Yeah, I sort of enjoy the ones without sugar. Yeah, yeah. so I guess it, de it depends on your palate mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about the dietary guidelines and other changes that have come up? Sure. Well, as far as the dietary guidelines go, we actually don't know what the 2015 dietary guidelines are going to be. What okay. we do have is the report that was issued by the committee, and you're probably asking me because I served on the committee mm -hmm. as vice chair. And um, what we did is we summarized the data and we made certain recommendations. Um, what the federal officials decide to do, we all will find out at the end of this year. However, our main emphasis really was on dietary patterns, and that goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, that we really need to take the whole picture into consideration, not just individual foods, because that's sort of mm -hmm. what got us into trouble with the fat in the 90s. Yeah. So a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and low non-fat dairy products and fish, legumes, nuts, and lean meat. Great, well, if you can believe it, we're almost at the end of our show. Is there anything else that you wanna leave us with or maybe talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that's being done at the Tufts Nutrition Center on Aging? Well, there's certainly a lot of studies that are going on at the Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University, and we're actively recruiting subjects. Um, some of them are long-term, some of them are short-term, some of them we provide all the food, and you have to come in about three times a week. Mm. In other cases, it's uh, supplement studies, and you may only need to come in once every three weeks. So there's a really a wide range of studies. Um, there is a website that one can go to okay. to look at the range, and then it's fine to just send in a query, ask, try to find out about the range of studies that's available, or a specific one if there's a specific one that um, interests you. But it, there's no reason to avoid um, contact because it doesn't obligate you to participate in a study. We just want to tell you about what studies are available. Well, thank you so much for coming today and talking to us about all this stuff. It was so interesting, and you know we'll have to have you come back again and tell us about the, the research that's more research that's being done. Sure, hey, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for watching Seniors Count, brought to you by Mayor Martin J. Walsh and our Commissioner Emily Shea. To contact us, please call 617-635-4366 or the Mayor's 24-hour hotline at 617-635-4500. You can email us at elderly at boston.gov or you can find us on Facebook. See you next time. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to my